again, thank you for being here today and for joining us at Grace Bible Church, both here in person and online. Thank you uh, for being a part of this. Uh, we have been looking at Jesus' parables, and we're going to look at some more parables this morning. Uh, when Jesus told stories, uh, people listened. He was a great storyteller. And uh, we call his stories parables. And we call them parables because it wasn't just a story for entertainment purposes. It, 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 um, it hid a truth. It, it revealed a mystery uh, about how God works in our world and also reveals to us, uh, it gives us a, a, a perspective of how we are to live our lives. And so these parables contained secrets sometimes. Now, I realize that when we talk about secrets, a lot of times secrets get us in trouble. Uh, we we uh, can, can find ourselves in hot water uh, with certain secrets that we keep that get revealed. And it reminds me of a story of three preachers that were out uh, fishing one day and uh, they were not very productive in their efforts to catch any fish. And so to pass the time, one preacher said to the other two, hey guys, since it's just the three of us out here, why don't we share our darkest secret sins with one another. And that way we can pray for one another. And the other two agreed, and so they decided they would do this. And so the first guy said, well, my secret sin is that I like to go to the beach and watch pretty women. And the other preacher, he spoke up, he said, well, my secret sin is that I get online and I gamble. The third preacher was reluctant to share, and they finally kept pressuring and pressing. said, what is your secret sin? We shared ours. What is yours? So finally he said, well, my secret sin is I like to talk about other people. <laughs> he was a gossip. <laughs> so sometimes secrets get us into trouble, but not so with our Lord's secrets. Our Lord's secrets reveal to us things that we need to know and allow us to see life, see the world uh, through a new lens. And I think you're going to see that this morning as we look at three of Jesus' parables. Notice what he says in Matthew 13 starts off simply, Jesus told them another parable. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. I want to stop right there for a moment because from now on, as we look at these parables, you're going to see that each one of them start with this phrase of Jesus saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, it is, it is said 32 times. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like. And this, this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, we need to unpack it a little bit because the kingdom of heaven is not just something in the future. The kingdom of heaven is present. It has two aspects to it. It is present and it is future. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like something, he's not just talking about what it's going to be like one day. He's talking about what it's like today. And, and so the kingdom of heaven is not, is not something that's, that's going to have a ruler one day. It is something that has a ruler today. And it's active in our lives now. The kingdom of heaven is. It's a part of our world. And we're going to unpack that and look at that in just a moment. But it's important for you and I to remember this phrase is very much linked to Jesus. It's linked to the fact that He came and He died on the cross and He arose from the grave. He established the kingdom of heaven in the world at that time. But He's also coming again. And so the kingdom of heaven speaks to what Jesus has done, what Jesus is doing, and what He is going to do in the future. And so it's important that we remember that as we look at the kingdom of heaven. But as He's describing this kingdom that's a part of our world today, He says it's like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping... His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. 
And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So it's important to remember as we look at this that Jesus is not talking about what's going to happen one day. He is talking about what is happening right now. He he was indicating that as he told this story, as he told this parable to the disciples and to the crowd that was gathered there, he was saying the kingdom of heaven, which is already here because he was the kingdom of heaven, this is already happening. It was happening in their world. It's happening in our world. And it's important for you and I to remember this. He says that right now, good seed is being planted in the world. That word good means it's intentional. It's not random. It's not not happening by chance. No, that, that this farmer intentionally went and got good seed and he is planting good seed in the world right now. But there's also an enemy. A covert enemy. One that we can't see. One that works in the shadows. One that, that, that is, is, is always under the radar. And this enemy is also planting bad seed. And the Jesus calls it weed. Now we have a whole new term for weed in our world. It's not the same thing. The weed that Jesus was talking about, it's called bearded darnel. And what would happen in ancient times is that uh, if someone planted wheat in their field and they had an enemy that came in the middle of the night, he would plant what is called a bearded darnel in that same field. Seed needs to germinate, needs to die, then it sprouts up out of the ground. And as it begins to grow, you cannot tell the difference between wheat and bearded darnel. As they're growing together, as they're maturing and coming up out of the ground, You can't tell they look exactly the same. It is not until fruit starts getting produced, until the heads of wheat start forming, that the farmer or the workers in the field can tell the difference between what is wheat and what is weed. Up until that moment, they look exactly the same. And so the story that Jesus is telling, this guy comes and and the workers come back to Jesus and they say, look, uh, come back to the farmer and they say, look, um, somebody has planted bad seed in your field. There is wheat there, but there's also weed there. They're growing together. Do you want us to separate the weed from the wheat? Do you want us to start working through the field and pulling up that which is not supposed to be there? And what does the farmer say? No, no. Leave them alone. Let them grow together. And then he explains why. Because if you try to pull up the bad, you're going to uproot some of the good. So let them grow together. Because the only way something good could be lost is if we're trying to eradicate the bad. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that for just a moment. I can't think of a better time for you and I to be thinking about what Jesus was telling us in this parable. The only way good can be hurt is if you and I try to eradicate the bad. Let me see if I can explain it this way. You remember a couple of decades ago when abortion was the hot political topic. Candidates were building their entire platforms around whether they were pro-life or pro-choice. It hasn't left the, the process, but there was a time when it was a major part of the process. 
During that time, during that season of our, our country's history, there were many people who began to oppose abortion, and I would say rightly so. They should, and we should continue to oppose abortion. But some of those in that opposition actually went out and planted bombs in abortion clinics. Do you remember that? Now then, they crossed a line. You see, they were opposing evil, but in the process of opposing evil, they became evil. And that's what Jesus is talking about to you and I. Folks, we are living in a time, as God's people, we should be opposing the monsters of our world. But we cannot become monsters ourselves. And when I think about what's going on in the, in the political landscape of our country, I can't help but think we need leaders, we need political leaders who will oppose the monsters of this world. But please, don't become a monster while you do it. Jesus says that good and bad must grow together. And it leads me to, to this secret. That the good of God's kingdom is not harmed by the growth of evil. Did you see that in what Jesus was talking about? The good is not harmed by the growth of evil. The fruit of the wheat is not diminished by the growth of the weed. Did you get it? Did you see it? The only time the wheat is harmed is if we try to eradicate the weed. Folks, you and I, in today's world, we should do everything in our power to oppose the evil in our world. We just can't become evil while we're doing it. And can I tell you something? Evil is never going to leave our world. Can, can, I, can I just briefly tell you why <laughs> our current political system, both Democrat and Republican, they paddle in fear. They're selling us fear. Why? Because fear generates money. That's what's going on. That's all that's happening. And, and we're never going to get rid of the evil in our world. We'll never get rid of poverty. We will never get rid of inequality. We will never get rid of racism. We will never get rid of the devaluing of life in our society. Those things will never go away. They are monsters that we must always oppose. But anyone who stands up and tells you we're going to take them out of society is lying to you. Those things were here before we got here. They will be here after we leave. Because good and evil grow together. And the only time good is ever really harmed is if we try to eradicate the evil. But we should always oppose it. Always. Always. And right now, what's going on in our political system is we have the Democrats telling you that if you vote Republican, you're going to lose your rights. You're going to lose your guns. You're going to lose your freedoms. You're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose. What is that translated? Fear. Fear. And the Republicans are doing the exact same thing. If you vote Democrat, you're going to lose these things. You're going to lose something that's valuable to you. It's not going to be there anymore. You're, that's how fear is translated in our society. You're going to lose something. And it's just fear. We need to be looking for people who will oppose monsters and not become one. And Jesus is simply saying that in our world, good and evil grow together. And it's happening right now. It's happening right now. The good that God has planted in the world 
it cannot be thwarted by the evil in the world. It cannot be thwarted by it. Why are we so afraid? It cannot be thwarted. That wasn't the only story Jesus told. Look at what He said next. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds can come and perch in its branches. Again, he says the kingdom of heaven is like. What is he saying? This is happening right now. This is just like good and evil are being planted in the world right now, so is the kingdom of heaven like a man who intentionally plants a certain type of seed in his garden. This is not random. This is not, this is not an open field where, hey, I just happened to throw a mustard seed out there. No, this guy intentionally wanted a mustard seed plant in his garden we have some friends that live down the street from us they went on vacation a couple of weeks ago and they told us that while they were gone we could go by and pick tomatoes off their tomato plants do you know those tomato plants didn't grow in their yard just randomly they had to plant them it was an it was intentional on their part they wanted tomato plants in certain places in their garden that's how you get a garden that's what you do in a garden and that's what the kingdom of heaven is like god plants certain things in the world and they look small and insignificant. They look like they're really not that important, but they grow into something that is bigger than anything else in the garden. And see, that's the secret of what he's talking about here. God's kingdom appears insignificant, but it grows to greatness. And if you want to look at it this way, think about it like this. Most of the times when we look at our own lives and we think about where we fit in the world and what we're doing in the world, we we might feel insignificant. We might feel small, like we're not really making that much difference as we follow Jesus. But that is not how it works. Everything that appears small that is following the Lord Jesus Christ has potential to grow into something great. And God intentionally has put each and every one of us where we are. The neighborhood you live in, the place you go to work, the school you attend, that person you sit beside at work or at school, none of that was random. God intentionally put you there. He put you there. And I know you might feel small. You might feel insignificant. You might feel like you're inadequate to even be in the garden. But God put you there. And there is potential for greatness because you are following Him. Shoot, that's good preaching. Somebody should have said amen. Amen. That's good stuff. It makes me feel better about my small insignificant life sometimes. I hope it does you too. Jesus went on to tell another story. Look at what He said. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Well, I had to be honest with you. I had to research this one because I know absolutely nothing about cooking. So I had to look it up. So here's what I discovered about yeast. Yeast creates a chemical reaction within dough that when you stick it in the oven, it will cause bread to rise. But here's what's interesting. It only takes a little bit of yeast to work its way through the entire batch of dough. In other words, in Jesus' story, the lady that was working the dough, she had 60 pounds of dough. She didn't need 60 pounds of yeast. It's not one for one ratio. Just a little bit of yeast is a a change agent that changes the entire lump. And the kingdom of heaven is like this. Right now in today's world, just a little truth can change the entire thing. Just a little love, just a little forgiveness, just a little bit of what it means to follow the Lord Jesus can change an entire situation. It doesn't doesn't have to be one for one. Do you realize that just a little love can conquer a lot of hate? Just a little bit. 
We don't have to be the largest. We don't have to have the most money. We don't have to be a political force. We don't have to have all these things that you hear on the news. It just takes a little bit to be a change agent to change the entire thing. That's how the kingdom of God works. That's how the kingdom of heaven works. The secret is, is that the kingdoms, God's kingdom is an agent of change that impacts everyone. That's, how the, that's not how the kingdom of heaven is going to work. That's how it works today. Right now in our world. This is how the kingdom of heaven works. It is not what we are told. It is not what we hear on NPR, Fox, or CNN. But this is how it works. Jesus wasn't done. Look at what He says next. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Matthew is giving us a little footnote here. He's saying Jesus speaking to people in parables was prophesied back in the Old Testament. It was, it was a sign to let people know this is the Son of God because the Son of God is going to come and He's going to teach in parables things that have never been taught before. And why did Jesus use parables? We, we talked about it last week. Let me remind you, there's three reasons why Jesus taught in parables. The first was, for those who are following Jesus, a parable, a story, enlightens them more. It like gives them more truth in their, in their pursuit of knowing and following Jesus. That, that story becomes a light bulb that brightens their faith. That's one reason he tells parables. Another reason that he tells parables is because people who have already rejected Christ, that same story will push them farther into darkness. They will hear the exact same thing, but they will not receive any light from it. In fact, it pushes them farther away. They hear the story and walk away saying, that didn't make any sense. That doesn't apply to us today. That won't work in our world. That's not how it is. And many times those are religious people. They're not atheists. They're not, they're, they're not the people out there that, that, you know, that we would call godless people who care about no one. No, most of the time it's the people who go to church. They're very religious. Many times they're moral. And they've accepted a lot of things about God and Jesus in their head, but it's never made it to their heart. And they hear that parable. They hear that story. And it really means nothing to them. They just move on. It was just a nice little antidote but it's no impact whatsoever in their life. The third reason Jesus tells parables is for the undecided. It's that person out there who, who they, they haven't made their mind up about Jesus. They don't know if they want to follow Him yet or not. And they hear a story like these that are Jesus talking about how good and evil works in the world and about how something that is small and insignificant can grow to be the largest thing and about how just a little bit of good can, can change the entire world. And for someone out there who's undecided about Jesus, they hear that and they say, I want to be a part of that. I want my life to be like that. And it's an open door that Jesus is calling them through so that they might enter into a relationship with Him. And that's why Jesus told parables. That's what this is all about. But Jesus wasn't done. The Bible tells us, then He left the crowd and went into the house. And His disciples came to Him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. I find that very interesting because of the three, that's the one I want to know more about too. What about you? Amen. Of the three, that's the one that's kind of like, hey, can you expand on that one just a little bit more? Because this whole idea of good and evil coexisting together, you know, I didn't think that's what it was about. Jesus, I thought you were here to exterminate everything that was bad in the world. So Jesus answered their question. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed, so that's really important, you can't see it in our English language, but literally what Jesus is saying right there is the one who is sowing good seed 
It's present tense. It's not something that's just happened in the past. It's happening right now. Good seed is being planted in the world. Who's planting it? Look at what He says. The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. Jesus is doing it right now. Right now in our world, good seed is being planted in our world. And look at what He says. The field is the world. How did I know that it was happening in the world? Because He told me. He tells us right here that the, that the field is the world. A lot of times, uh, people will take this exact parable and say it's about the church. That it's about good and bad people in the church, all kinds of stuff. They miss the boat completely because Jesus says this is about the world. It's not about the church. So right now, in the world, Jesus is active in the world planting good seed all on this planet right now. Right now. Isn't it amazing? I, I'm, just, I'm just amazed by the fact that we are, mo we, have, we are more connected in the world right now than we ever be have been in history. I can know what's happening on the other side of the planet within seconds. And yet sometimes I think so small only about myself. Amen. And Jesus is involved in the world right now planting Good seed. And notice what he says. This good seed, it's intentional. That word good means it's not, by, it's not by chance. It's not random. He's intentionally planting good seed in the world. And the good seed stands for the people in the kingdom. Folks, the good seed are actual noses and rear ends. <laughs> People in the world. People. It's not theory. It's, 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 not, it's not just, well, I think that. No, he actually says the seed stands for the good people God has planted in this world. And he is planting in this world. It hasn't, he hasn't stopped. He's still doing it. But notice what he says. He's not done. The weeds are the people of the evil one. So again, we, the weeds, are, they're real people. They, they, they count for noses and rear ends, okay? They're, they're real people in the world who are planted here, he tells us, by the devil. The enemy who sows them is the devil. That word devil... Is, is, a, is an entity, whether you want to call it a person, a force, a fallen angel, that's what the Bible calls him. But that devil is the one who opposes God, but not only that, he opposes anything good. And so what's happening in the world today is that we have good people who have been planted there by God. We have evil people who have been planted there by the devil. Honestly, folks, that is above my pay grade. I do not understand how all of that fits together. I'm just telling you what's in the Scriptures, what Jesus said Himself. That that is what is happening in the world right now. And notice, there's only two kinds of people. And we hate that. We hate it, don't we? One of the worst places I could ever take Cherry is where she only has two options. Because she loves options. And we like to believe, we like to believe that there are many options for all of us. I'm not, I'm not all good, but I'm not all bad. I'm somewhere in between. Not according to Jesus. According to Jesus, there's only two kinds of people. There's good people that the Heavenly Father, that Jesus Himself has planted in the world, and then there's evil people who have been planted here by the devil. This does not remove our responsibility. This does not remove our free will of choice. We're still engaged in whether we end up good or evil. All that kind of stuff. I'm just telling you, there's only two kinds of people in the world. Notice what Jesus says. The harvest is the end of the age. The end of the age is the second coming of Christ. It's not the rapture of the church. The end of the age is at the end. When, when history ends as we know it, 
That's what Jesus is, is, is talking about. And the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. I love that phrase because what it's saying here is that the angels will weed out of our world not just the people who are evil, but all the systems of our world that are evil. And they are gone. They will never exist again. And they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So let's talk about the implications of good seed, evil weed, and the harvest. First of all, evil is allowed to grow only for a season. Did you see that in the story? Jesus made it very clear. Evil exists and it will grow alongside good, but evil has a shelf life. There will come a point where evil ceases to exist and good will carry on. So, so our world is going to have evil in it as long as there's uh, uh, until, until the end of the age. There's nothing. Anyone who tells you they can remove evil from the world is lying to you. They can't, it can't be done. It can't be, I don't care how well intended they are. We should always oppose evil, but we cannot eradicate evil. It's in our world. But only for a season. The harvest will come. The second thing that I'd like to point out is that evil is cast into eternal, into eternal punishment. So the kingdom's angels will come and they'll separate what's bad from what is good. And they'll bundle up everything as bad. And the Bible tells us that it will be cast into the lake of fire where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Man, nobody likes to talk about this. I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it. Because if Jesus is right, I believe He is. That means there's real people with noses and rear ends who are going to be bound up and cast into the lake of fire. I don't like that. It breaks my heart. I find no pleasure in that. I find nothing good about that. I, I, I don't like anything about it. Because I, 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 I live in a world where I rub shoulders with people and I can't tell if they're good or bad. And neither can you. I, I, at my best guess, I, someone might be good, someone might be bad. And I don't know. I don't know for sure because I can't see anyone's heart. I don't know exactly what's going on. But this is what I know. There's only two kinds of people in the world. And those that are, that are evil, those that are bad, they're, th those that are, they're, I'm friends with them. I probably have family. I probably go to church with some of them. I, there's, there's some I probably love. There's some I probably really care about. And it bothers me. That's what's going to happen. And the Bible makes it very clear. It makes it very clear that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know what that phrase means? That phrase, that phrase leaves us no doubt whatsoever that there's going to be great misery and loss in eternity for those that are separated from God. And that phrase seals it. That bothers me. Because I love people. Or at least I try to. And I don't want anyone to go through that. The last is that good becomes acceptable as righteous and remains in the kingdom. Those that are separated, that are pulled out, you have your evil, then you have your good. This word good... This is so important to remember. This good. We, when we think of good, we think, oh, I did something good that made me good. That's not what this is saying at all. These people that are good have been made acceptable. How, how were they made acceptable? They were made acceptable through a relationship with Jesus Christ. They became a part of the kingdom. And when they became a part of the kingdom, they were made good. They were made acceptable. They didn't do anything to themselves. They just responded to God's grace. And it leaves me with this question that I, that I have to leave you with this morning. Are you good seed or evil weed? Because that's the only two options we got. 
That's it. And, and you've sat here this morning, whether you're in this room or whether you've been listening online, you, you, you've sat through this and you, you've heard these parables and one of three things has happened. One, you're a follower in Jesus Christ and as you've listened to this, your life has been enlightened. Your faith is now brighter. You understand something that you didn't understand before because that's what a parable does for those that follow Jesus. Or you're someone who has rejected Christ. That doesn't mean you're not religious. That doesn't mean that you're not trying to be moral. That doesn't mean that you're not trying to make good decisions and be a good person. We can do all of those things and still reject Christ. And you have listened to the same parables. You have listened to the same stories. You've heard the same truth and it means nothing to you. It means nothing. It's like, oh, that's a nice little antidote. Ooh, that gave me a little goose bump. And that's as far as it goes. Or, you're sitting there, you're watching, and you're undecided. And you have listened to God's Word. You have listened to these stories. And you now realize this is a door. This is an opportunity. This is a chance for you to walk into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is calling you from where you are to where He is. And asking you to be a part of His kingdom. My prayer is that if you see a door in front of you, that you walk through it. That you walk through it right now. If you're here this morning and you'd like to walk through that door, you want to talk to someone, then you come see me when service is over. You come find Pastor Jason. You come find one of our elders. Find somebody. Somebody here will talk to you. If you're online, Pastor Stephen is online right now. Tell him. Tell him. Just pound it out on the keyboard and let him talk to you. Don't remain outside that door. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Please come back and join us again next week. Have a great week.